Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Will you turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Luke and the 14th chapter and the 25th verse. Luke 14, 25. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all of the whole it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his favor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Shall we just bow before the Lord in prayer as we turn to the word? Again, praying together the prayer which I offer on your behalf and mine. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Speak just now some message to meet my need, which thou only dost know. Speak now through thy holy word and make me see some wonderful truth thou hast to show to me. For Jesus' sake. Amen. He send us an M and desire a message of peace a condition. And whosoever likewise you that ever he be not all that he forsaketh not he hath disciple cannot be my salt is good have lost but as a salt his favor shall it wherewith is he fit for the land? It is neither for the dunghill, nor yet one of us is either a missionary or a mission field. And my prayer, and the prayer of many of us, I'm sure, is that these days mission fields may become missionaries. That's true of everybody, either a missionary or a mission field. Right where we are, here, now, in Moody Bible Institute, in Chicago, anywhere, a missionary or a mission field. And we have based all this upon four simple propositions, that the world is smaller than we think, and the task greater than we think, the time shorter than we think, the term costlier than we think. If we're going to communicate our faith to the generation in which we live, the terms are costlier than we think. And it's with the last of these four simple statements that we are going to consider this morning. The terms are costlier than we think. Do we all realize that about two-thirds of the world's population have never heard of Christ? And do we all realize that 90% of Christian work is done among 10% of the world's population? In the light of these facts, I have been forced back 
to ask myself and satisfy my mind before God two questions which in his name I would put to you this morning for you to ask and satisfy yourself before him the first is this did the death of Christ upon Calvary provide adequate salvation for everybody let me repeat that did the death of Christ upon the cross provide an adequate salvation for everyone in all the world for all time until he comes again my answer to that question based upon the scripture is yes he is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto God by him he is not willing that one should perish a salvation adequate for everyone there is no sin that has gone too far that the cross of Christ can go further and there is no habit that is too deeply formed in any of our lives that the blood of Jesus can cleanse he breaks the power of cancelled sin he sets the prisoner free his blood can make a foul of clean his blood avails for me my second question does that mean that all men everywhere will be saved and that's what we're being taught in some areas today that if there's anybody lost eternally in hell that means that there's a breakdown in the love of God but with all the authority of the word of God behind me and the conviction of the Holy Spirit my answer to the second question will all men ultimately be saved my answer is no for he has provided salvation adequate for all but effective only in those who believe and repent salvation sufficient for everyone everywhere but a salvation which is operative only in the lives of those who repent and believe if that's not true you will have to cut out whole portions of the gospel of Matthew and practically the entire book of Revelation all men will not be saved my third question can anybody be saved without hearing the gospel and that forced, forces me back in my mind immediately to Romans chapter 10 whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved but how shall they call on him on whom they have not heard and how shall they believe on him whom we have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach without the descent nobody can be saved unless they hear I remember a dear man of God once standing up at a young people's meeting and saying when I was younger I used to pray Lord show me what it means for a soul to be lost and he said God never answered that prayer because I believe that if he had, he had answered it I'd have gone stark staring mad I'd have gone raving mad if he'd really shown me what it meant for a soul to be lost eternally it was John Wesley who said that if hell is real and if we believed it every one of us would go across Britain on a road if need be on a road studded with nails on our knees in order to save men from hell but we don't believe that these days or if we believe it we don't act like it 
For if this is right and true, if the answers to these three questions are what I suggest they are, we are called for immediate reassessment. First of all, how much of our church program is relevant to the 20th century? We've organized out the Holy Spirit. How much room is there in your church program for God, the Holy Ghost, to work? We're satisfied every week, apparently, with a song service, hymn, prayer, reading, notices, offering, special number, anthem, hymn, sermon, prayer, hymn of invitation in which nothing ever happens, benediction, and then we all go home. Twice a week, twice a day, 52 weeks in the year. There's not the slightest evidence of God moving in to do the supernatural. Some of us would be as amazed if we saw Christianity really at work as we profess to be amazed if it's doubted. What room is there for God really to move in to do a miracle? How much of our church program is geared to the need of people who wouldn't dream of coming inside our church door? Is it relevant to a generation which couldn't care less what we believe? and wouldn't dream of coming inside our evangelical fundamental churches. I say that this situation in which we live today calls for an immediate reassessment of the way that we're going about the task. We're all praying church. Just a good program. Just good music, average preaching, right doctrine, and we churn it out week after week, and millions of people on our doorstep are going to hell. And if we believe it, we don't act like it. It calls not only for a reassessment immediately, before it's too late, of our Christian education, of our whole program of evangelical thinking and approach. But it calls also for a reassessment of our personal life. In the light of the facts which I have given you this morning that 90% of Christian work is done among 10% of the world's population, and over two billion people alive today are on the road to a lost eternity. While I acknowledge that not every one of us can have the privilege of going overseas, I suggest to you that the burden of proof lies heavily upon every one of us here to satisfy the Lord that the circumstances in which he has placed us justify us remaining at home. It's not enough to say, I am willing for whatever the Lord may need. I must take steps to see whether or not he really wants me to remain in a country which has been surfeited with the gospel. I admit the need in the United States and in Britain is desperate. But it cannot compare with the need of continents which are absolutely in the dark and have never heard the name of Jesus. The burden of proof, I repeat, lies heavily upon every one of us to satisfy God that the circumstances in which he has placed us justify us remaining at home. It calls for a reassessment of our church program. It calls for a reassessment of our personal life. And it calls for a recognition that the terms of discipleship 
are costlier than we think. And therefore this morning our subject as we think of the communication of our faith is the requirement that we must recognize. Did you notice that three times over in this chapter that I read to you we had the phrase he cannot be my disciple. Verse 26 last phrase of the verse he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27 last few words, few words he cannot be my disciple. Verse 33, he cannot be my disciple. Let me just dispel an illusion which may be in your mind. There's no difference between a disciple and a Christian. The words are synonymous in the New Testament. They mean the same thing. A disciple is simply a Christian who is growing up. You remember, we are told in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26 that Christians, the disciples, were first called Christians at Antioch. The two words are the same. So here is the Lord Jesus laying down in no uncertain terms what it costs to be a Christian. Someone has said that being a Christian is like joining a club. The entrance fee, nothing. The subscription, all you've got. In a sense, that's true. And here, I am today giving you not my condition, but the master's condition, which have never been watered down and never been changed his terms for being a follower of his. You notice that in verse 25 there went great multitudes with him. What an opportunity to take names and addresses. What an opportunity to take up an offering. What an opportunity to call in the television. What an opportunity to have the press around and report it. Great multitudes flocking after him. And he turned to them and said, If any man. It's as if he held them back and spoke to them one by one and said, If any man. Today at the Institute is perhaps a strategic day, a momentous day, it's a day of prayer, a day of waiting upon God, a day in which the whole faculty have felt the burden and the concern to call you aside from study of books for a day, that you might seek the face of God. That's a wonderful thing. My heart goes out to a institute that is prepared to do that. And I want simply this morning to remind you very, very lovingly of the master's terms which you must face and I must face in my life if I'm going to be a Christian. The first of them, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not, his father, mother and wife, children, brethren, sisters, Yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. Have you had any difficulty with that verse? Has it troubled you? Does that mean to say that in order to be a Christian I've got to have a personal animosity in regard to my family? Of course it doesn't. Let me put it in the more positive way in which Matthew translates the same statement. If any man loves father or mother, brother or sister more than me, he is not worthy of me. And it seems to me that here the Lord Jesus is saying to me, to my heart this morning, two things. He's saying to me, first of all, that he's the only one 
who has the right to make a home as well as to break it. As a matter of fact, he's the only one who can make a home. I mustn't get diverted, but uh, I want to say to you that the only marriage that is happy is not the one where the wife dominates the husband or the husband dominates the wife, but where both husband and wife are dominated by the Lord. A few months ago I was in Bristol in England and I only stayed a night in the home and uh, they had scads of children. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think it was 11. An absolute football team. And they varied in age from about 21 to 3. Do you know that at 7.30 in the morning a bell rang? And I responded to it. I felt it, it had a sound of authority about it. I suppose you know a bit about bells around here. And this bell rang and I leapt to it and I went downstairs and I, there was a tremendous scurry. And from every part of the house somebody was running. And they all arrived at the same time around a huge breakfast table. Actually, it was a table tennis table with a, with a cloth on it. <laughs> and uh, yes, it was. It's the only way they could all sit down together. And there they were. Various stages of dress and undress. Half shaved, hair half brushed and not brushed at all. Some still in their pajamas and some just ready to go. And... Uh, father opened the word and read a chapter and then scripture union notes for the day and then the whole family knelt and every one of them prayed individually a missionary a friend a need a person and that home was like a bed of heaven Oh, it would have been so easy in that home for all that to be crowded out. The easiest thing in the world. But, and this bell, and I went down, I leapt to it, there was a tremendous, and I, and every part of this story, and from the house, somebody was ruined like that. Nobody else can. He is not only the only one who can make a home, but he's the only one who can break it. What do I mean by that? Just this, at any time he has the right to step into a home and help himself to a boy, a girl, out of that home and thrust them out into his service to the uttermost parts of the earth. And speaking as a father, not as a preacher, who's been through the experience when the valedictory service comes and one of those precious children whom you've brought into the world and God has taken into his service I tell you there's a tear in one eye but there's a twinkle in the other for God has done such a wonderful thing he's helped himself to that son or that daughter you won't see them again for five years if you see them at all that they've responded to the greatest thing of all. God has called them into his service. And let me say a word to you in utmost love and tenderness. If you come from a home where your parents are unsaved, and you have had all the agony of the battle of that, even to get to a, to a, to a Bible school, let me say to you that the key to their conversion is your obedience to the Lord Jesus. If you say, well, I can't possibly go, I must obey my parents, I must, I must go along with them, they don't want it, I can't hurt them, I can't afford to do it, you'll discover that in the Christian life inevitably you're bound to hurt somebody and often it's the very people you don't want to hurt. You either grieve and hurt the Lord or you hurt someone down here. You can't have harmony at both ends of the line. You either have conflict with heaven or you have controversy on earth. 
But if you want to see those parents of yours, one for the Lord, obedience to the Lord Jesus at all costs, is what matters. He's the only one who has right to break a home and make it. This verse almost tells me, also tells me, that I must have no rivals in my love life to Christ. If any man love more than me, he's not worthy of me. We pass that test today. No rivals in my love life, in my affection life to Christ. He must be first. Some years ago, following the morning service at my church, a girl came up to me, a young girl, and held out her left hand and showed me on one finger a diamond. So I rejoiced with her. I'm uh, always thankful when that happened. And uh, I knew the fellow she was engaged to, an awfully nice Christian boy. I was so happy about it. Provisionally, they arranged the date. Six months later, after morning service, she came into my study, held out her hand. She couldn't speak, but there was no dance. I said to her, what's the matter? What's happened? Oh, she said, nothing, really. But, <laughs> yeah, only this, I've become increasingly conscious in these six months that God wants me in Thailand as a missionary with OMF. My fiancé feels he ought to stay in Britain. He hasn't any call for the mission field. We've battled with this for months, that's all. And God has had his way. Two months ago, less than a year ago, I was in Thailand at an OMF conference and met her. And she looked at me with a shining face and she said to me, I'd a thousand times rather be here in the will of God unmarried than in Britain out of the will of God unmarried. No rival in our affection life to Christ. Oh, it doesn't always happen like that. Not always tough like that. I think that the moment, a thrilling thing that happened to me just recently, I was in Ethiopia at the SIM conference about 18 months ago, <coughs> and there's a fellow there, he's about 35 years of age, a bachelor. And I was there a week in that station and at his conference, but I knew him pretty well. When I left, just before I left, I shook hands with him and I said, Bill, there's only one thing the matter with you. And he said, what's that? You need a wife. And I'm going to pray for you. Where do you live, Bill? Oh, he said, uh, Melbourne, Australia. I said, I'm coming to Melbourne at Christmas. I'll tell you what we'll do, Bill. I'll pray for you that you may have your wife. And when I come to Melbourne for this Christmas, I'll take you and your fiancé out to lunch. Oh, he said, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> there were a lot of eligible missionaries on the field and all were sort of uh, looking at that his way, but he wasn't having anything to do with any of them. But you know, when I went away, he wrote to me, and he said to me, that word of yours came to me somehow right from the Lord. And you know what happened? He went home on fellow in November, convinced that that was of God. And on his way home to Australia, in Singapore, he bought an engagement ring. Never even seen the girl. <laughs> and at the same time, he bought a watch. Beautiful watch. Showed it to me. It was called a Rebecca watch. Uh, a splendid timepiece. And he said, Now, Lord, make this an Isaac and Rebecca relationship. And let the first girl I meet in Melbourne be the one. And so it 
so he went to Melbourne and the first night of his furlough he was due to speak at MBI which in Melbourne is the Melbourne Bible Institute and as he was going up onto the platform to speak he bumped into a girl coming down he said hello and she said hello and after the meeting he met her that was in November and when I was there two days before Christmas I took them out for lunch <laughs> they were engaged to be married and you know what she'd already been accepted by the SIM she had a heart set on going to Ethiopia and today they're on the same missionary station man and wife in the country to which he'd been called and to which she was called led together by divine appointment both of them determined that nothing would ever and nobody come into their lives that was contrary to the will of God and there they are today on the mission field oh God does wonderful things when we really give him every bit of our life no rival in our love life to the Lord Jesus my dear friends as a man who just loves being with young people working with them I just say take your hands off and watch God work miracles no rival in your love life to Christ is that true right now of you? that may mean the breaking of a friendship that may mean putting your Isaac on the altar that may mean breaking an engagement that mean being, will mean being thoroughly realistic in God's presence but it will mean ultimately the will of God being done in your life no rival in your love life to Christ the second thing no right except to do the will of God whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple what does it mean to bear his cross some people have an extraordinary idea of what that means a fellow came up to me and speak to me after the service in church and he said to me pastor he said I have a shocking temper I blow my top for nothing I suppose that's my cross hmm and I said to him bless your heart it's not your cross it's your wife's cross she's got to live with it how amazing that we can rationalize a thing like that that's not your cross man that's your sin God has given Jesus for you to make you sweet instead of sour and grumpy not your cross what does it mean who does not bear his cross Matthew 16 24 again puts it more clearly in a positive sense if any man would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me let him as the New English Bible has it let him leave himself behind no right except the right to do the will of God the Christian life isn't broad at the beginning and gradually narrowing down we don't all sort of crowd in together we go in one by one straight as the gate narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it and when you go in that gate you've got to leave yourself behind you can't take two masters no man can serve two masters either he loves the one and hates the other or hates the one and holds to the other you cannot serve God and that if you would come after me then leave yourself behind there can only be one master no right except to do the will of God now of course this is something which has because of failure to understand it has led to missionary casualty after missionary casualty it's led to collapse in Christian service and Christian life have you heard somebody say perhaps you said it yourself I had a perfect right to be consulted in that situation 
Nobody asked me to in my opinion. I'm going to resign. I had a right to be heard. A right to hear my opinion stated. A right to have my views expressed. A right? Let this mind be in you which was in Christ. Who counted it not a thing to be grasped after being the equal with God, but humbled himself, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of man, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And why? Because he forsook all his right. He counted not a thing to the grass up. And he stepped from a throne, came right down to the cross. What was he doing? Forsaking his right. I have a right to be consulted. I have a right to my own life. I have a right to do my own way. I haven't any right except to do his will. And it's failure to recognize that that has absolutely caused the Christian church to be paralyzed. Resignation from church ball. Resignation from the mission field. Because I wasn't consulted. My rights weren't considered. You haven't any right. You've died to them all. Your only right is to do his will. If any man doth not bear his cross and come out to me, can't be my disciple. Just look with me how that worked out in the life of the Apostle Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 with me a moment, will you? Here's the example of a man who had every right, but he mistook him for Jesus. A man whose authority in the ministry was being challenged by this carnal church, who questioned his right to speak to him as he did. Verse 3, my answer to them that do examine me is this. Have I not power to eat and to drink? I have a right to normal ration. Have I not power to lead about a sister and a wife? I have a right to normal romance. Or I only and Barnabas, haven't I the power to forbear working? I have a right to normal recreation. Verse 14. So hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. I have a right to normal remuneration. Verse 15. But I have used none of these things. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Oh yes, I have a perfect right. I have an absolute right to normal rations. An absolute right to normal women. To normal recreation, to normal remuneration. But just all, I've, I've refused them and thrown them all aside for Jesus' sake. Now let me bring that up to eight. Right here in October 1968 to Moody Bible Institute, student body, all of us, myself included. Haven't I got a right to normal food? Oh, sure. Say, have you ever denied yourself a meal for the sake of Jesus? Have you ever fasted for Christ's sake and for the sake of prayer to lay hold of him? You have a right. You have a right to normal food. Nobody can deny it. You have. Have it right. But say, one time or other there'll come a point where Jesus will test you. Are you prepared to miss one meal or one day that you might really lay hold of God and show me that you mean business? Of course, fasting is much more than missing a meal. Fasting is absolute denying myself and the flesh. All its ways and all its rights. But have you even gone so far as to miss a meal for Jesus? You have a right to normal romance, power to lead about a sister and a wife. But it may well be that the Lord will test you about that. You have a right to normal romance. I underline the word normal. Perhaps it's a bit difficult to know what that means these days. I remember last summer I went to the island of Jersey. That's 
in the Channel Islands, some distance south of England. And I was there to find some sunshine because we hadn't any that summer. And I didn't find any in Jersey either. But I saw a very extraordinary thing. I saw in the streets of Jersey, stopped just in front of me, a hippie van. Mobile van. And out of it jumped four or five of the most extraordinary looking creatures I've ever seen. I wouldn't know whether they were fellows or girls. And on the back of that van, there was a heart drawn and an arrow through it. And uh, the statement, let's not make war, let's make love. Now, that's very plausible. It sounds wonderful. Sounds as if we've got the answer, but you know what it means, don't you? It means every barrier down. Every indulgence of every kind of sexual appetite, regardless of the marriage tie. If you become a follower of the Lord Jesus, you're listening, aren't you? That kind of romance is out. You're entitled, every one of us is entitled to normal romance. Say, fellows and girls, is your romantic life getting out of hand? And has the Holy Spirit been speaking to you about it? Oh, you have a right to normal romance! And the loveliest, and the normal, and the wonderful, and the thrilling is that which is within the marriage tie. You have a right to that. You have no right to the other. And if it gets out of hand, it'll ruin your studies at the Institute and all your future life. But you're right to normal romance. But even there, God may well test you. Verse 6. You have a right to normal recreation. You have a right to normal remuneration. May I just take you very quickly this morning for a, a glimpse in a mission field in the Central Africa Republic. And there, on the Sudan border, south of the Sudan, I went and stayed and saw 35,000 Sudanese refugees who had been thrown out of Egypt by Nasser for no other sin than that they weren't Muslim. Some of them bankers, some of them lawyers, some of them doctors, some of them well-educated, some of them speaking English well. And they were destitute. Nothing to live on, no clothes, hardly, except what's on their back. Red Cross trying its best to do something for them. Into that situation, the Africa Inland Mission had sent two girls. Can you underline that in your mind? Two girls. There hadn't any men. They lived in a house that was built in three weeks. No sanitation. No shop, no day off a week, no nice things to see, they didn't bother about that. But when my wife and I left that place, we came away feeling so absolutely humbled because we had met two people who had touched a depth of exhilaration and joy in doing the will of God that they didn't matter about anything else. All they were concerned about was that some of those 35,000 destitute, helpless people might be one for the Lord. They had every right to a normal man, every right to normal recreation. But the died it all, and denying it had found life. Earlier, at same tour, I flew from Nairobi in a missionary aviation fellowship plane piloted by Gordon Marshall. The MAS does a tremendous service job for missionaries. I lived with Gordon Marshall for two or three days. 
Missionary Aviation Fellowship pilot is not only a pilot, but is an engineer, a navigator, missionary shopper, and above all, an evangelist. After seven hours weary flying a one-engine Cessna jet at about 140 miles an hour at 8,000 feet, being tossed about like a cork, and having two stops on the way, being interrogated by customs officials and answering tricky questions, at the end of the day, taking orders for missionaries absolutely exhausted, I saw him on his knees with his Bible. Midnight, he was in bed. Five o'clock the next morning, he was up again on his knees with his Bible. Out to prepare his plane for the next leg of the flight, witnessing in the language of the people with an open Bible about Christ. I saw a man who was a pilot, a navigator, everything, but above all, a man of God. And listen, Gordon Marshall is a South African, could be flying for South African Airways today and earning $30,000 a year, instead of which he's earning a pittance through Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Why? Because he has no right, except to do the will of God. I have no right except to do God's will, have I acknowledged it? One more thing. He that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Does that mean to say that a Christian is someone who goes to his bank manager, if he has one, and gives away all his money? Well, some people God will ask to do that. But that isn't what this text means. It means much more than that. F-A-I-T-H Forsaking all, I take him. That's faith. And except a man forsake all confidence in himself and put all confidence in me, says Jesus, he cannot be my disciple. And I want except he moves off the ground of self-confidence onto the ground of Christ's confidence. Except he gives himself completely and takes me completely. He cannot be my disciple. For the whole essence of the Christian life is an exchange of sovereignty in which it's no longer I but Jesus. And I don't go on giving and giving and giving myself, but I go on taking and taking and taking Christ. Have you ever, when you're tempted to blow your top very quickly, said to him, thank you, Lord Jesus, I take your patience. When you're tempted to impurity of thought, have you ever said, thank you, Lord Jesus, I take your holiness? Have you ever discovered that the opposite to all that you are is in Jesus? And it is in you to produce it through you day by day? Except a man forsake all that he has. Except he comes to a point of absolute disillusionment, absolute despair in himself, and begins to lay hold of an indwelling Lord and sovereign, he cannot be my disciple. One of the most gracious men I ever met, wonderful Christian men, whose books many of you will have read, was the late Dr. S. C. Meyer, whose studies in Bible characters were tremendous. Joseph Abraham Allred. One day at a Keswick convention in England with 8,000 people present, he was preaching. And he was that kind of preacher who never preached at a congregation. He was right alongside them. And he gave a testimony. And that testimony said, three years ago, as a minister, something came into my life which I knew was wrong. But I loved it. And I didn't think it would affect anybody but me. But from then on, every time I preached, that thing came between me and the congregation. 
It came between me and power and God. And congregations grew smaller and smaller. Nothing ever happened. And my heart was so filled with a sense of guilt and sin. And I fought with it and struggled with it and I went on preaching. But he said, before I came up to Keswick, I went away alone. And like Jacob, I wrestled with God all night. And I said, oh Lord, you had every key to every part of my life except one. And I've hung on to it and it's ruining my life and testimony ministry. Lord Jesus, please, I can't go on like this, please. Take this key, the last key. And F.B. Meyer, when he gave his testimony, said with a face that absolutely glowed with the glory of God, he said, you know what the Lord Jesus did? He never took that key. He took out the door and in place of the door he put in a window and ever since then the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has shone into my heart. You know that day at Keswick there was scarcely a dry eye in the congregation. And all the various missionary house parties and people that were staying there, 8,000 of them, like for on till 2 and 3 in the morning, people getting right with God. And a real breath of spiritual revival struck that place. Listen, do you want revival? Really? You just talk about it? What do you want? In your life? In the institute? In your church? In your ministry? Do you? Are you prepared to say to him, Lord, take the key, every key, not just 90% of them, not just 99 out of 100, but Lord, every key. And he's reminding you, even now, as I close my message, of that one key that holds back the power, the blessing, the joy that you need in your life today. No rival, no right, no reservation. Lord, every key. Let's pray. Just let us have a moment of silent prayer. Many of you here have followed me sympathetically, prayerfully. You've entered into life and into victory by the grace of God. And you know the thrill. None of us perfect, but we press on toward the mark. Many more, however, in this school at this point this morning are desperately needy mission fields simply because God hasn't been allowed to have every key. There are rivals. There are other rights. There are reservations. Are you prepared today at this moment to tell him you've abandoned all that? Other lords have long held sway. Now thy name alone to bear. Are you prepared to hand to Christ every key just in a moment of quietness that the hush of God's spirit upon us may I ask all of you who right now are saying to him Lord Jesus I've been battling and fighting resisting I've had reservations I've had claims and other rights I've had rivals but now Lord it's you first in everything May I ask that those who are saying that to Jesus today, not those of you who have already said it, but those of you who are saying it now, I want you to stand and I want to pray for you. All those who are saying, Lord Jesus, today, this be the day when you have every key. Would you just quietly rise to your feet?
remember, I'm not speaking to those of you who entered into this experience, but those of you who now just know that there cannot be another day go on in your life when you have rivals and rights that you insist upon and reservations and they're all going. Some of you may have made that transaction but withdrawn it, but today desire to renew it. To you also, I'm speaking, and I trust the Lord has spoken. And we're going to close in a word of prayer for you, particularly. Anybody else? Would like to stand. No right. No rival. No reservation. Oh dear Lord, how we thank thee today for the gracious moving and working of thy Holy Spirit in our hearts. God, we believe that beyond the human voice with all its imperfection, beyond the message with all its simplicity and faltering delivery. You have shown yourself, and many have heard another voice. Deep place in their hearts like an alarm bell, knowing that life can't go on as it is. Such a mess, such failure. And here we stand in thy presence, many, this morning, to witness to this fact. And our heart's desire is that thou wilt cleanse us from our sin, Lord. Put thy power within, Lord. Take us as we are, Lord, and make us all I know. Keep us day by day, Lord, underneath thy sway, Lord. Make our hearts thy palace and thy royal throne. How we thank thee that as we cast our burden upon the Lord thou dost sustain. As we commit our way to the Lord and trust in him, thou dost bring it to pass. How we thank thee that all the responsibility of the future is at thy feet. That the government is upon thy shoulder. And how we praise thee that there's no tangle of circumstance, no defeat in our lives, nothing impossible with God. Lord, send us from this place this morning. Grant that the sessions of prayer might be precious to us. And as we pray together, may what thou hast done to us in these mornings, in these days, that this morning especially, be worked out before thee in believing prayer. May thou shine upon this place and upon every heart this day. Make it to be just an anteroom to heaven, where the glory of the Lord is revealed where the shout of a king is in the camp, where Jesus himself makes himself known to us as a living right reality, when he becomes more precious than he's ever been in our lives. Hear our prayer, Lord. We are not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, but we praise thee that thou hast loved us with an everlasting love, and our hearts would be wide open and tender toward thee today. Each one of us would say, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the voice of sin, I resign. Answer prayer. For the sake of thy kingdom, for the glory of thy name, and for the sake of perishing multitudes who will wait that the hearing of the gospel through lies, utterly abandoned to God the Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.